Physical Gold Fund presents The Gold Chronicles with Jim Rickards and Alex Stanzik. Insights and analysis about economics, geopolitics, global finance and gold. This is Alex Danzig, and I have with me today Mr. Jim Rickards. Welcome, Jim. Alex, great to be with you. All right, so why don't we just start diving into our topics here. Um, the first one is on counterparty risk mitigation, so I have a quick story to tell. Last month, I uh, spent three days in the Colorado Rockies with seven former Navy SEALs, and we were doing some firearms training. And one of the principles that they taught me is that whatever they do as part of their SOP, the criteria is, is that it must work 100% of the time. So for example, they have specific protocols that they follow to ensure that they never have what they call a dead man's gun. And a dead man's gun is where they pull the trigger and the gun goes click instead of bang. So I'm sure our listeners can understand why in their line of work, this would be a really bad thing to have happen. It occurred to me while we were doing this that the same principles actually apply to how investors conduct due diligence on who they invest with. So specifically, does the investor who is conducting due diligence go through the steps to identify the counterparty service providers and do a risk assessment as to how well they're going to perform under market duress? So in other words, uh, in, in, even if they will perform, so, so in other words, will that gun go click instead of bang? during a liquidity crisis. So listeners may or may not know, but Jim's been asked by the Pentagon on several occasions to participate in financial warfare simulations as a game theory expert. So Jim, as an expert in this area, I have kind of a two-part question. Number one, why is physical gold a good way to mitigate counterparty risk? And number two, what kind of scenarios do you see that might make paper gold fail under a liquidity crisis or under market stress? Well, those are great questions, Alex, and lead to a lot of uh, you know, a lot of different approaches. You know, I've never uh, uh, climbed up in, into the mountains with uh, with seven Navy SEALs. That sounds like a fun exercise. I've met a few Navy SEALs uh, in my travels, and they're they're very cool guys and have some interesting stories uh, to tell, but never quite as rigorous what, as what you did. But I have done uh, quite a bit of mountain climbing and um, at high altitude, and whenever you're out there, you know, you're, you're exposed. It's you're subject to the elements, uh, whether it's um, you know high altitude, thin air, glaciers, avalanches, crevasse danger, uh, you know, etc. There's a lot of objective danger and subjective danger. You're always part of a system, and the system could be, uh, you, you know, you've got your own equipment, you've got your ice axe and your crampons and things that you're relying on, but you're you're typically roped to another member of the team, and uh, the team could be three or four climbers, and you're all roped together. And the idea there is if one climber punches through a crevasse, falls into a hidden crevasse so you don't see, just falls in. The other climbers go into what they call an arrest, which is you, you kind of dive into the snow in a very set way and dig your ax and you make yourself a human anchor. And in theory, the worst thing that happens is uh, the, the climber who fell in is kind of dangling there, but they can be saved. They can be rescued. They don't fall all the way into the crevasse. In a worst case, some momentum comes in. People don't do the arrest quickly and the whole team gets dragged into the cross. That's not supposed to happen. But the point is, um, any, and I've, I've done some ice climbing where, um, again, you've got ice screws, uh, carabiners, uh, ropes, knots, et cetera, and any system, and I'll obviously bring this back to the financial system in a second, any system is only as strong as the weakest link. It's kind of like an obvious statement. You know, kids learn, you know, chain is only as strong as the weakest link. But it's true. If you've got a really secure, you know, chrome steel ice screw anchored into a, you know, a vertical waterfall and, you know, your carabiners uh, clipped correctly and, um, you know, your knots, every, everything's right. But, you know, you rappel off the end of your rope because your rope wasn't long enough and, and you die because, you know, you didn't tie a knot in the end. That one flaw, you can have a perfect system, but that one flaw will cause a fatality. Um, and so so you're constantly going over, you know, my my harness, my knots, my rope, my my equipment, my screws, my carabiner, whatever it is. You check and double check everything. There's a little on the thread on a carabiner, there's a little red paint. And if it's not 
tightened all the way, the red shows. And uh, the expression is, if you see red, you're dead. These are just reminders. So um, I'm sure that's what the Navy SEALs were talking about when they want zero um, things to go wrong. And the same is true in finance. Now, uh, you mentioned some of the game theoretic work I did for the Pentagon. That's very, very valuable. But I have some more hands-on experience. For 10 years of my career, I was the uh, chief credit officer, one of the largest primary dealers. Primary dealers are uh, dealers in U.S. government securities. They're the ones who make the market. You know, when the uh, when the, when the Fed wants to buy or sell securities, which is how the Fed prints money or or reduces the money supply, Fed conducts monetary policy through the purchase and sale of government securities. They have an approved list of people that they'll do business with. They won't just call up anybody. Uh, and the primary dealers are the are the names of the firms on that list. And my my client, and the firm I work for, um, was uh, was one of those firms. And um, it's uh, when I was hired, I went you know a normal recruiting process, and the CEO said to me, he said, Jim, here, here's how we look at your position. We know how to bring money in the front door. We're scared to death it's going to go out the back door. In other words, you can have the best traders and the best talent in the world and the best computers and the best everything and make a lot of money. But if you're doing business with a counterparty who's not reliable, and let's say you have a $10 million profit, you did some great trade and it's a $10 million profit, and you turned to sell the trade and that firm just filed for bankruptcy, or that firm won't deliver, or that firm is uh, you know, putting up some legal objection uh, based on documents, et cetera, then you're not going to get your money. So, um, so credit is credit is the is the is the flip side of uh, trading. You know, as traders try to make a profit, but the credit guy has to go collect it. You know, you got to get the money. You have to settle the trade. Uh, and when you when you're looking at things through that end of the telescope, you know, things look very differently. Big um, big profits are actually, you know, the thing you worry about because again, you're you're trying to settle the trade. Then, so you go through the chain of settlement. The chain of credit, the chain of legal documentation, and it's a lot like this: the climbing system that I described, where you might have seven or eight or nine different points of failure, different pieces of equipment all strung together in such a way that any one failure will lead to a fatality. Well, when you're when you're trading, and this could be gold, this could be um, securities, you know, stocks, bonds, it could be real estate, it could be anything. Um, there's a chain of you know, potential points of failure. Uh, one, did you get the trade right? Did you make money? That, that's important. Uh, how good is your legal documentation? Now, what if, um, what if there's some uh, dispute? Did you go to arbitration? Did you go to litigation? Uh, is there a force majeure clause? Force majeure is a fancy Latin term, but what it means is that uh, you know it's a superior force, meaning I can get out of my contractual obligations because there was an earthquake or because the government changed the rules, and that's uh, therefore I don't have to perform. That's called force majeure. You know, read the fine print in these contracts. Is there a material adverse change clause where um, you have an open contract, you're making money? But you get a termination notice because something on your end happened. Your, you know, your net capital went down, or uh, um, there was some other criteria that they used in the uh, material adverse change clause. So that's, that's the legal side of it. And then uh, there's operational risk. You know, just simple things. Wire instructions. Did you send it to the wrong account? Did they put in the right amount? How good is the back office? Did they check out the trade? I mean, I'm, I'm being a little long-winded, but my my point, Alex, is that there's a lot more to making money. Than making money, meaning, yeah, you got to get the trade right. You got to do the right asset allocation. You have to get your entry points and exit points right. But that's only the beginning of profiting on a trade. Beyond that, you have all these other issues I mentioned your specific legal documents, the overall rule of law, force majeure, settlement, clearance, credit, performance potential legal risk, bankruptcy. What happens in bankruptcy? Do you get to show up in the court and Bring your contract and say, Your Honor, you know, give me my money because I made a profit on the trade. Or do you get thrown into a pool of unsecured creditors and and the court says, you know, we'll get back to you. We got a whole bunch of people like you. Uh, none of you guys are getting paid. You're going to have to wait and see. That's what bankruptcy is all about. So, uh, you know, but then there within the bankruptcy code, there are exceptions to exceptions. Certain transactions are not subject to what's called the automatic stay. When a, when a counterparty files for bankruptcy. The first thing that happens is there's what's called an automatic stay. That means you, the counterparties, you, the creditors, are stayed or prevented from litigation. You can't sue the counterparty. The, the counterparty, the guy who filed for bankruptcy, is basically saying to the court, give me protection from all my creditors who are coming after me for their money. Well, the court does that. The law does that. It says you creditors have to just you know, kind of sh 
show up in court with your proof of claim and wait to see what happens um, and see how it all plays out. But there are certain transactions exempt from that. Guess which ones are exempt? The ones that Wall Street likes because they rigged the code. I, I used to be a Washington lobbyist. I used to do this for a living, and I, I know how we rigged the legislation with – with our friendly members, but uh, members of Congress, but uh, repos are exempt, derivatives are exempt, uh, futures are exempt, et cetera. So a lot of times the the uh, the Wall Street firm, if uh, if they file for bankruptcy, uh, you might not be able to come after them. But if you file for bankruptcy, they don't have to. Uh, sorry, if you file for bankruptcy, they can come after you. But if they file for bankruptcy, they're they can still um, – I apologize. I've got this backwards. If um, if you're the one filing for bankruptcy, you're the one in distress, they can take your collateral. They're not prevented by the bankruptcy code from going ahead and um, uh, you're doing what they need, what's called self-help. So uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But the point is there's just a whole bunch of stuff, you know, legal documents, rule of law, uh, bankruptcy code, uh, collateral, uh, margin calls, uh, settlement clearance, et cetera. Now, getting to your original point – if I own physical gold and I have it in non-bank storage, I have it in safe custody, I don't have any of those risks. I'm not relying on anyone to perform. I'm not relying on anyone to deliver. Uh, I'm not relying on anyone's good credit. I'm not relying on the Federal Reserve to maintain price stability, you know, et cetera. There are just tons and tons of risks in the system beyond the obvious ones. When most people think about risk, they think of the risk of the market going up or the risk of the market going down. In other words, the risk of profit and loss. And sure, that's a good place to start. But that's one of about 20 risks that I could mention, and a lot of which I just did, uh, before you as the investor actually you know, get to collect your profits. So, um, And as that applies to what's called paper gold. So what is paper gold? Um, these are gold futures. They're gold options. Um, they're what are called unallocated forwards. Uh, there's there's something called the London Bullion Market Association (LBMA). This is a club of the uh, largest banks. Not that many of them. I uh, don't know the exact count today, but it's it's around 10, uh, maybe maybe fewer. Uh, they're the obvious names: HSBC, Goldman Sachs, Citi, a few others. They make the market in gold. They write the rules as to what's you know what's good delivery, what's acceptable storage. They have lists of approved. You know, secure logistics operators. So a good, so good firms like Brinks and Loomis, they'll be on the list. Maybe some fly-by-night newbie, uh, you know, armored car company will not be on the list. You know, et cetera. Uh, approved refiners, approved vaults, uh, et cetera. So they they kind of control the physical gold market. Uh, but when you call them and say I want to buy gold, they'll send you a contract and they ask you to fill it out and send it back and open an account and fund the account and all that good stuff. But assuming you get through all that and you call and you say, I want to buy, you know, a ton of gold, and that's a lot of gold, um, they'll typically have what's called an unallocated forward, meaning uh, say, okay, uh, whatever today's price is, you know, $1,305 an ounce, you know, however many ounces, you know, 100,000 ounces, whatever, done. Um, and you pay them that much and they send you a confirmation. They say you own the gold. But if you read the fine print, what you find out is that you don't really own the gold. What you own is uh, they say there's gold and there is some, but not nearly enough to go around. Uh, you don't have what's called allocated gold. The, the gold is – there might be like one bar of gold and the, and 100 – and they, they, they might sell 100 paper bars for every one physical bar. Uh, gee, what would happen if all 100 holders showed up on the same day to get the gold? Well, the answer is 99 of them would go away empty-handed, maybe all 100. You know, at most, one would get the bar of gold, and the other 99 would go away empty-handed because there's not that much gold. So these are highly leveraged situations. They're really kind of off-exchange futures contracts uh, where, again, you're depending on the performance of the bank to collect your profits. The banks um, – rely on the fact that uh, that everyone's not going to come in for their gold at once. It's kind of like deposits. If every depositor at a bank showed up to take their money out, the, the bank would not have enough money. The banks take the money and they they make loans. You know, they, you can't call a commercial loan overnight. Uh, you can't call a mortgage loan overnight. And that's what they do with the money. So they could never call all that money in that quickly. They would never be able to give you all the money. They'd have to go to the Federal Reserve, you know, and, and discount some assets. So so the point being, they rely on stability, they rely on inertia, they rely on a lot of things that mean that 
not everyone's going to come for their gold. Same thing is true in the futures market. Uh, Comex has designated gold warehouses. All the gold in those warehouses is nowhere near, nowhere near the size of the uh, gold that's underlying all the futures contracts that are outstanding. So so these are, these are the risks you take when you're in these paper markets. Now, if not much is happening and the price of gold isn't moving very much and everyone's happy with the paper, um, nothing bad happens, but you're not making any money either, particularly, um, maybe a little bit. But in, in when is gold going to soar? When is gold going to go up, you know, $100 an ounce per day, $200 per ounce per day, $1,000 per per ounce, you know, per week. When is that going to happen? That's going to happen in a financial panic, in an extreme financial panic, like what we had in 2008, probably worse. What's going to be the reaction of people? They're all going to show up and want their gold. Exactly the scenario that the banks and futures exchanges are not prepared to deal with, that's the scenario that's going to happen. At that point, and this kind of goes back to what we said before, at that point, they will send you a termination notice. If you read the fine print in the contracts, they can do this. They'll send you a termination notice. They'll take yesterday's closing price. They'll compute your profit if you have one, probably do. They'll send you a check for that amount. But you're like, wait a second. I didn't want yesterday's profit. I want today's profit. I want tomorrow's profit. The day after, that's why I bought the gold. This scenario is why I bought the gold. It's going up $200 an ounce a day. What about those profits? They'll say, too bad. We closed out your contract. Here's your check. And so whereas if you have physical gold, you don't have that problem. So I'll, I'll just sum up by saying that with physical gold, um, you're not relying on anybody's performance. You're not worried about legal contracts. It, it may be a contract with a vault or you know a, a custodian, but not with the bank performance or exchange performance. And people tend to overlook those risks. Right. So... In other words, if there was somehow some way that you could sort of disintermediate the banks and maybe buy and sell your gold directly through Swiss refineries, for example, that might be a good thing. Oh, absolutely. It, it look, it's simple. The more um, the more intermediaries you have, the more risk you have, the more performance risk you have. And banks are the worst because they're they're regulated by governments. They're controlled by governments. If governments decide, you know, now's the time to you know, uh, let people know they can't have their gold or uh, now's the time to uh, tell the banks they have to lock down the exchanges and can't, can't settle the contracts. And, uh, you know, what I call what I refer to in my book, The Road to Ruin as ICE-9, meaning the whole system becomes frozen, locked in place. Um, you're going to be the first one to feel the pain. Uh, whereas if you have a non-bank intermediary or you're dealing directly with a refiner or, you know, th th there's, there's typically some intermediary. If you have the physical gold in, uh, uh, you know, in a private vault that you control the access to, that's one thing. That, that's hard to do and uh, it's not everyone's cup of tea. Um, but uh, so you're probably relying on somebody somewhere. But the fewer people you're relying on and the fewer of those who are regulated entities – the better. So it's exactly like your Navy SEAL friends saying, you know, let's, you know, keep it simple. Uh, the more complicated we make this, the more things that can go wrong. And same thing I experienced in climbing, the more uh, links in the chain, the more things that can go wrong. Mm -hmm. Makes perfect sense. Okay, so let's move on to our next topic. We started covering North Korea back in our April podcast when pretty much nobody else was talking about it. For me, this was one of those situations where Jim starts talking about an issue and I'm scratching my head going, why, why is he even interested in this? But as usual, in, in the course of time, it turns out to be a big deal and this has. So since our last update, Jim, you have continued to say that the war with North Korea is imminent, or I should say war with North Korea is imminent, all the while facing harsh criticism for this forecast. It, and it's it's almost as if people would rather this just went away. I have to admit, I'm, I'm one of those people. But let's let's do a quick recap since our last podcast, because this hasn't gone away and seems to be escalating. So on August 28th, North Korea fired another missile. It flew over Japan at a total range of 1,677 miles. Then on September 3rd, North Korea conducted its sixth nuclear weapons test, claiming it triggered its first hydrogen bomb. And uh, the USGS measured it as a 6.3 magnitude seismic event. The Japanese Defense Ministry estimated its, its yield at about 160 kilotons. That's the equivalent of about 160,000 tons of TNT explosive. So Pyongyang 
claims that the new hydrogen bomb payload can be mounted on an ICBM. In response to this, President Trump tweeted out that North Korea's words and actions continue to be very hostile and dangerous to the United States. So those words in my mind basically means he's considering this a national security threat, obviously. September 11th, the UN Security Council voted unanimously to impose an oil embargo and additional financial sanctions. September 14th, North Korea fired a second missile over Japan. This one traveled 2,300 miles. Um, with this range, by the way, Guam is in the reach of a new, uh, North Korean missile strike. Yesterday, Trump addressed the UN regarding North Korea, and he said, if the US must defend itself or its allies, we will have no choice but to totally destroy North Korea, adding that Rocket Man is on a suicide mission for himself and his regime. So, Jim, you, you in the past said that capital markets are a complex system, and you've used the analogy of it being like a snowpack on a mountainside, which can transition, which could transition into an avalanche. And uh, recently you stated that you are now identifying North Korea as a pretty big snowflake that, can, that could cause that. What's your latest thinking on this? Yeah, that that pretty much is my latest thinking, Alex. I, by the way, I think about this every day, and uh, you know, one of uh, there are a number of elements in the models I use for predictive analytics, whether it's forecasting markets or forecasting geopolitical events, and one of them is um, just the use of uh, what's called Bayes rule or Bayes theorem, uh, Bayesian statistics. It's it's a branch of statistical science. Uh, interestingly, I just got back from um, I was in Europe last week, and I was in London. Uh, for a few days, and got to visit the the gravesite of Thomas Bayes, who is the uh, the inventor of Bayes' theorem. Uh, it's a uh, he died. He's an 18th century uh, English minister. Uh, uh, he died Presbyterian, I think. He he died you know, over 200 years ago. Uh, there's nothing new about Bayes' theorem. It's been updated, and the French. French mathematicians contributed to it, and there are 20th century versions of it. Uh, so it's it's been updated and approved and made more rigorous. And obviously today you can automate it and put in computers and scan news services. So the, there's a lot you can do with it. But it all goes back to his original insights, and and the rule is named after him. Uh, so we, we, as I say, we paid a nice um, nice visit to the um, to the gravesite. But uh, so what you do when you're a Bayesian, you continually update. In other words, you form a hypothesis based on whatever evidence you have. Bayes' rule is, the, is that's how you solve problems when you don't have enough information. And I learned this working for the U.S. intelligence community. The problems that the intelligence community confronts are almost always the ones where there's not enough information. If you had all the information, a high school kid could do it. You, as an intelligence analyst, you get the problems where you don't have enough information, but there's still life or death issues and you have to face up to them using the best tools you can. Uh, just to paraphrase uh, Secretary Don Rumsfeld, you, you know, you go to war with the data you have. Um, and you know, I, we, I use this quite a bit in counterterrorism, but the more I used it, my my team used it, the more we realized that it had much broader applicability, which, which of course it does. It's used in anti-submarine warfare, it's used to find missing aircraft, it, it was used to break the Enigma code, it's used for a lot of things. Um, so I scan um, speeches, newspapers, press releases, articles, developments, tests, whatever I can find every day to update this hypothesis. But I haven't seen anything that causes me to significantly lower the probability of war, which I, I have is quite high, sad to say. And, uh, you know, people have often, you know, kind of listened to my analysis and said, OK, Jim, I hope you're wrong. And my answer is, I hope I'm wrong, too. Uh, but I don't think I am, and I wouldn't be giving this analysis if I did. Um, so the, this analysis, let me just break it down as simply as I can. I can make it complicated, but we can make it pretty simple. Kim Jong-un is in what's called breakout mode. He's going for nuclear weapons. This is, when I say nuclear weapons, you know, what he's exploding, this H-bomb, these are technically what are called nuclear devices. Uh, they could be the size of a truck. Uh, okay, he's got he's got fissile material. Uh, he was able to create a fusion-type reaction. That's what differentiates an H-bomb from an atomic bomb. Um, <coughs> pardon me, apparently with success. Um, so that's a lot of engineering and a lot of science. 
But it doesn't mean that it will fit on a warhead yet. He's certainly working on that. That's called miniaturization. Uh, there's no evidence yet that he has that. They've made some claims, but no real, no hard evidence that they have that. The intelligence community does not think he does. Uh, but he's dangerously close. So we can't sit around waiting until he does. But then it'll be too late. When he, when he's got the ICBMs and has the warhead and it is miniaturized and it is mounted on the ICBM and he has a couple of them so he has basically an, uh, an arsenal of nuclear tipped uh, ICBMs it'll be too late at that point the US won't do anything because the the risk is we do something and he fires a nuclear missile at uh, Los Angeles and kills 4 million Americans and he would say I was justified because you attacked me and you know I had these weapons if we're going to do anything and I believe we are just to be clear we have to do it before he gets to that stage but this is why you can forecast the timing because he's not that far away now if you thought he was doing this for show or he was doing it to gain negotiating leverage, or he was doing it to say, hey, United States, look at me, look what I can do. Now give me some concessions, give me some economic relief. He could do that with a phone call. He wouldn't have to set off a hydrogen bomb. All he'd have to do is call Secretary Tillerson or President Trump and say, you know, I want to talk, and we'd be there in a heartbeat, and we'd give him pretty much whatever he wanted in exchange for verifiably um, terminating his weapons programs. And we've said that publicly. So he can, so he's not doing that. That means that this is not a negotiating posture. He's going for it. And by the way, the operational tempo, you mentioned a few of the uh, missile tests, but he's fired over 60 missiles uh, in just a few years. His father, over a much longer period of time, fired about 30 missiles in over like a 20 year period. He's fired 60 missiles in about a four year period. So the operational tempo has picked up enormously. So this is not a guy who's taking baby steps. It's not a guy who's looking for leverage. It's not a guy who wants to negotiate. He's just going for it. Once, see, that's a very dangerous position to be in because it invites an attack. It invites a preventive war from the United States. And he knows that much. Uh, so the faster he gets it, the safer he is. So far from doing surreptitiously and underground and baby steps and try to sneak up on us. Uh, he's going for it very boldly, openly, knowing that we know what he's doing. Uh, but once you do that, you better cross the finish line before, you know, time runs out. So, um, so, he, so he's going for it. No reason to think he'll be deterred. He hasn't been deterred by anything that's happened so far. These new sanctions are weak. Kind of, I hate to say they're a joke. I think I, I think Nikki Haley did, uh, our, our UN ambassador did a fine job of getting the Russians and Chinese not to veto it, and giving it some teeth. So that's good. But it, it, they're they're pretty weak. For one thing, uh, Kim Jong Un saw it coming a mile away, and he loaded up on oil. He fit, he has his own strategic petroleum reserve. And he filled it up before the sanctions were imposed. So, oh, you can't import oil into North Korea. Well, guess what? He's got a lot of oil. Not, you know, enough to last for a year. Uh, plus there's cheating. Plus they burn coal. Plus they can bring coal in from Russia by rail. The, Russia has like a short 20-mile border. Most people think North Korea's borders with China. Most of it is. But there's a little strip uh, along the... Uh, on the eastern edge uh, where it's a border with Russia and there's a, there's a railroad and a highway that runs through there. So Vladimir Putin's supplying him with coal. So he's not cut off at all. He's not desperate for energy. Um, might have a little less hard currency, but the banks are still, you know, if the Chinese banks get shut down, the Russian banks will pick up where they left off. So he's, this, none of this is effective. So uh, there are things that could be done that would be more effective, but they're not being done. China doesn't want to do them. So Kim Jong-un's going for the weapons. The sanctions are not working. But so why is the US bothering? Well, the answer is that we know we're going to war, but to justify the war, you have to show you tried. You have to show you tried diplomacy, you tried sanctions, you tried the United Nations, you tried everything you could, and it failed. And then at that point, you're more justified in going to war. So we're in that, you know stage of just trying trying diplomacy showing the world we're we're, we're doing the best we can but uh, that's not going to change the outcome now so that's one issue kim jong-un is going for the weapons question number two will the united states permit him to get the weapons because if the answer to that is yes then everything you're saying is a big bluff and that's part of the problem because kim jong-un believes it's a bluff you're like gee what's wrong with the guy is he crazy doesn't he know we're gonna you know what trump's exact words we can destroy north korea um doesn't he know that why would he take that risk well the answer is uh a he thinks he's better off with the weapons than without them uh looking at guys like Gaddafi and saddam hussein who gave up their weapons and got killed and the Iranians who did not give up their weapons and are still alive, his conclusion is 
don't give up your weapons, you'll still be alive. So that's not irrational on his part. And he, he thinks we're bluffing because we didn't go ahead, Obama didn't go ahead with the, when he drew a red line in the sand in Syria, et cetera. Um, plus, it'll be a horrific war, you know, and so forth. The problem is we're not bluffing. Now, this is an existential threat. No flag officer, no commander in chief will risk the loss of an American city uh, based on um, uh, you know the impulses or the threats or the nuclear blackmail orchestrated by Kim Jong Un. Imagine if he had nuclear weapons and he just said, you know, I'm not going to attack Los Angeles, but I'm going to attack South Korea. I'm going to reunify the Korean Peninsula on my terms by force. And now the U.S. has to possibly intervene to, on the side of South Korea. This is like a replay of the original Korean War. And Kim Jong-un said, oh, not so fast. This is between me and the South Koreans. If you Americans intervene, I'm firing missiles your way. Now, now what do you do if, the, if you're the United States? Do you want to trade Seoul for Los Angeles? I don't think so. I mean, this. the point is this, this, this is game theoretic. This undermines the U.S. commitment to its allies. What about Japan? What about Taiwan? You know, et cetera. It, does North Korea just become a proxy for China uh, to to be the bad guy while China reaps all the benefits of destroying the U.S. alliances in East Asia. So these are these are the down the road issues that you know serious analysts are thinking about in the White House, in the National Security Council, and in the Pentagon. And when you when you analyze it that way, you you pretty quickly come to the conclusion: no, you cannot have these weapons because we know what you're going to do next, and that's just going to create a worse situation, and we're not going to take that risk. So. So A, Kim Jong-un is going for the weapons. B, the United States is determined that he cannot have the weapons. Uh, and so unless there's another force, such as China and Russia, which I don't see forthcoming, then we're going to have a war. We're going to war probably in the next six to eight months because beyond that, you're in the realm you know, late 2018, early 2019. You're now in the realm where he probably will be able to miniaturize the warhead and ruggedize it and improve the guidance systems and do everything necessary to create an actual ICBM uh, nuclear arsenal. So it'll be too late then. So um, so this war is coming. Um, there's only one wild card in the deck, one factor. And uh, you know, George Friedman has pointed to this. George Friedman is a great analyst. I read all his stuff. Uh, big fan of his. He says, look, uh, South Korea is not with the program. I mean, South Korea is pursuing uh, an appeasement type policy. They don't want this war. They, they have the most to lose. If this war breaks out, uh, Seoul's going to get battered. You're talking about tens of thousands, perhaps more. Uh, Koreans who will be South Koreans who will be killed. Uh, there are capital cities at risk. Um, a lot of Americans, too. There are, I believe, 70,000 Americans in or around Seoul. I mean, I've been to Seoul, Korea a number of times myself. There's a big American expatriate community there, not counting the troops. And we have over, you know, I think, about 50,000 troops. So Americans are on the front lines of this also, and Americans will be killed. Uh, but the South Koreans do have the most to lose. Um, but the, the question for the United States is, well, that's unfortunate, but we've got to look out for the United States. Um, and by the way, you're going to be in a better position with us than if you try to go neutral. So so right now, a lot of the action is discussions between the United States and, and South South Korea. There's no, no dialogue, maybe deep back channel with North Korea, but no real dialogue with North Korea. But there is a dialogue with South Korea trying to get them on board. The Japanese appear to be on board. So we're kind of stitching this alliance together. But at the end of the day, um, my expectation is notwithstanding South Korea's unwillingness and their appeasement uh, type policy, and I think Friedman's right to point to this, uh, that the United States would go ahead anyway because there's just too much at stake. Um, having said that, there, there are a couple other possibilities here. And one I'm hearing more about, you know, nothing totally concrete. It's what we call rumint, uh, you know, rumored intelligence. Uh, but there might be some secret weapons. I hate to make this sound like a superhero movie, but, you know, the U.S. doesn't sit still when it comes to R&D. And uh, my expectation is long before the uh, the B-2 bombers and the B-52 bombers and, uh, you know, the PSYOPs and a lot of other things got into play, that the lights would go out in North Korea. They would just go dark. Uh, that That's kind of obvious. That would disrupt the command and control. You try to decapitate the regime, uh, maybe a special operations mission just to kill uh, the leadership uh, so that nobody can give the orders to open up the artillery fire. But maybe there's a secret weapon. Could it be, uh, you know, this is speculation, just to be clear. Uh, 
you know, could it be, uh, you know, liquid laser, a sonic device, uh, who knows? But but at the highest levels and with the utmost secrecy, if President Trump had something along those lines to share with South Korea. Now, the problem with sharing anything with South Korea is if they're stuck on the appeasement policy, they might just tell North Korea and that would defeat the purpose. We'd lose the element of surprise. But um, there, there are a lot of wheels within wheels here. But big picture, Kim Jong-un has gone for the weapons. We won't let him have them. We're pursuing to go, we're pursuing diplomacy. Diplomacy won't work. Therefore, we're heading to war. A very sobering analysis. So we'll keep an eye on this, and um, we'll continue to take a look at it and, and report on it in future podcasts um, and, and take it from there. So shifting topics again, we're going to move on to, in our June podcast of this year, Jim, you and I, we did a pretty deep dive on the risks in cryptocurrency. We specifically warned that government regulation could pose a substantial risk to investors. And um, a couple of things have happened. In in July, um, the SEC ruled that ICO sales, these are um, initial coin offerings, are subject to the requirements of federal securities law. On September 5th, the co-director of the SEC said, as with any kind of newsworthy event, roaches kind of crawl out of the woodwork and try to scam money off of investors, which gives us some insight as to how some regulators are looking at initial coin offerings or ICOs. Then the big one lately is on September 15th, the Chinese government handed down orders to all the cryptocurrency exchanges in China that they were required to cease all operations. And within 24 hours of that hitting the news, cryptocurrency values plummeted. Some of them dropped as far as 34.2% in a single day. Um, with, with that in mind, Jim, what is, your, uh, what is your thoughts on this subject? Well, I think we, as I said, we, we covered it in, in the prior podcast. And what we're seeing now, Alex, is we're seeing the playing out of all the things we warned about. Uh, I believe I said at the time, uh, I know I've said uh, certainly in other venues, um, you know, ask yourself, who's in who's in this market? Who's in the Bitcoin market? Well, you have a lot of miners, so-called. These are people, basically, miners is a misnomer, but they, they've got massive, massive computing power, huge uh, uh, use of electricity, by the way, solving difficult math problems that get progressively more difficult as you mine each coin. Uh, and then if you solve these problems, and these are, these are the people who maintain the blockchain, by, by solving the problems, what you're really doing, you present what's called proof of work and you verify the transaction and that, valid, uh, that, that validates the blockchain and establishes ownership. It's all encrypted, but you know, with subject to the encryption, it establishes your ownership, let's say, of a certain number of Bitcoins. Well, um, you, you do that by solving these problems, but then you get rewarded. So by solving the problem, you get a certain number of Bitcoins yourself. Um, that just kind of come out of uh, out of the the algorithm, uh, and then you can sell those and get money, and that's how you get paid for this mining operation. Well, think about that for a second. Uh, you, you know, you've you've got a pretty big conflict of interest. So you're the miner. Uh, you got a big um, incentive to inflate the price of Bitcoin, to keep that price of Bitcoin as high as possible because your mining operation is so expensive. So there's good evidence of what are called wash sales, which are basically people that say you and I, you know, I saw, I say, hey, Alex, I'll sell you 100 Bitcoin at, um, you know, four $4,000. Um, each, you know, what's that? Uh, Forty thousand, uh, forty, uh, sorry, four hundred thousand uh, dollars, and then you sell them back to me for forty one hundred, and I sell them back to you for forty two hundred, and you sell them back to me for forty three hundred, and I sell them back to you for forty four hundred. We're not, we don't really have any profit and loss because all we're doing is selling the same bitcoins back and forth, but we're doing what's called painting the tape. These are called wash sales because we're just washing the transaction back and forth with no real P and L, no real profit and loss, but we're we're bidding it up a hundred bucks each time creating an exchange record that says, oh, gee, look at that. Look at the exchange. It's going up, up, up. I better buy some before uh, you know it runs away from me. So it's just a form of fraud. It's just a form of manipulation. Um, and uh, you know, one thing that strikes me is you know, every securities and commodities market in the history of the world, from Babylonia to Bernie Madoff, has been subject to fraud. 
But somehow we're supposed to think that Bitcoin's exempt. The Bitcoin is so pristine, so pure. There's the one market. You can count on that. There's no fraud there. Well, of course there's fraud. In fact, there's probably rampant fraud because it's unregulated. The reason we have all these regulations is because people committed frauds in all the other markets. So it's probably loaded with fraud in terms of the transacting parties. Now, who's using the Bitcoin? Uh, drug dealers, uh, arms dealers, uh, tax evaders, um, and worse. You know, what's worse than... Uh, uh, you know, a drug dealer will try, you know, child pornography. These these are the people who are actually using the Bitcoin on the dark web. So, okay, so you got a bunch of scummy people, you know, running the exchanges and you're doing wash sales and painting the tape. And you got a bunch of even scummier people who are using it to uh, conduct business. Uh, gee, what a, what a great market to be in. Um, I just, I don't know why anyone would touch it. Uh, but, uh I encountered a saying recently, I think it's one of those quotes that gets thrown around, I think I've heard it before, but um, I'll paraphrase it, said, nothing, nothing drives people crazier faster than the sight of other people making money. Um, you know, so the idea that somebody bought some Bitcoin and at least in nominal space it went up, uh, oh gee, I got to have some, it just drives people crazy that they're not in it, but they're being sucked in. Um, you know, the thing with the, um, interestingly about the millennials um, is that this is a generation that grew up playing video games. Not all of them, of course, I'm, I'm generalizing, but quite a few of them spent quite a bit of time playing video games. So when you're in video games, you're in a digital world inside your head. And a lot of these video games have currencies. Uh, you, This is how the video game you know, producers make money. They get you to give them dollars, real money, um, for sort of crypto money in the game, and then you can buy stuff. You know, if you're, it's a if it's a combat game, you can buy an extra tank, or if it's a gladiator game, you can buy an extra sword or whatever. So they kind of they kind of grew up as children using digital currency that came out of nowhere. So Bitcoin probably didn't seem that weird to them, but there are a lot of I think more savvy seasoned people out there who see the opportunity to rip other people off. And so the whole thing now has, you've got bubble dynamics, you've got a tool at mania kind of mentality. You've got a very, a lot of very naive users who, you know, think that it, it, it's just another game in effect. Uh, and then you've got some real scum who are uh, um, kind of running the show. I don't see the attraction, candidly, but I think this is all playing out. Although the other thing that people were naive about is that somehow this was exempt from the state. This was there was this libertarian libertarian dream that the state. Are you kidding me? I mean, uh, study history. States don't go down without a fight. State power can intervene anywhere they want. They can shut down exchanges, demand tax records, put people in jail, interrogate people. They've got you know means of violence at their disposal. Um, you know, don't underestimate state power when they see a threat, and they were they were starting to see a threat in terms of competing forms of money. So I expect the whole thing to kind of go away sooner than later. Not the blockchain. The blockchain, you know, it's, which is really now I think DLT or distributed ledger technology is probably the right way to think about it more so than blockchain. But be that as it may, that technology, you know, has a future. It's not going away. But that's too many people confuse the DLT, the distributed ledger technology, with the coin. Don't make that. Uh, don't fail to make that distinction. The, the technology could be good. That doesn't mean the coin's good. Yep. And speaking of government-issued digital technology, central bank blockchains, we've only got a couple of minutes left, so we're going to hit this one really fast. But there was a report issued by Australia's Black Economy Task Force, and they were weighing in on cryptocurrency. It's got some pretty concerning implications. The chairman of the Australian Securities and Investment Commission, basically the Australian SEC, predicted that traditional bank accounts may be unnecessary within a decade as central banks begin issuing their own Bitcoin-style digital fiat currency, so in other words, their own blockchain and then extending this to everyday transactions in the general population. He went on to say that with central bank issued digital currencies, you might not need a bank account anymore. And um, assuming that we take this guy um, at face value, that what he's saying at face value, this has some pretty scary implications. So here's a quick scenario. One, central banks issue their own digital blockchain currency which disintermediates the banks and retail transactions too. The government passes a new fiat currency law requiring the use of new their new digital only currency. Uh, three, the government then makes the older currency illegal, requires the population to use the new government issued digital currency for transactions. And what this allows is the government then has 100% visibility into what people own, 
uh, the ability to track, freeze, and confiscate people's wealth at will. Now, to be fair, you and I have talked about this before, Jim, governments can mostly do this already, but this would allow them to do it without having to go to the banks to, to accomplish it. So, Jim, we've already seen a trend towards eliminating paper. Uh, governments are pretty much broke. We, you know, The U.S. just passed $20 trillion in debt for the first time. Tax revenues globally are really not keeping pace with government spending. What's your view on a government-issued blockchain, and do you see this as a realistic course that governments might take? Yeah, I do, Alex. Actually, I think the summary you just gave was excellent, and that that path, that sequence you describe of, you know, first they build the the uh, the DLT, the distributed ledger technology, then they create um, their own coin, you know, the Australian dollar coin or the U.S. token or whatever, you know, whatever you want to call it. Then they mandate it. Then they ban paper currency and other alternate forms of currency, which is exactly what happened in India. Uh, and then they uh, disintermediate the banks. Everything you just described. I think that's not only possible, I think it's happening. Uh, and uh, it, it kind of goes back to what I said earlier now. But this is where the point I was making about, you know, because what happens, a lot of the Bitcoin groupies, you know, the Bitcoin cultists, they, they'll read a story like that and they'll throw it out on Twitter or throw it out on a podcast and say, see, you know, Australia is building a blockchain, so buy Bitcoin. And I'm like, no, Australia is building a blockchain, but it doesn't mean buy Bitcoin, it means Bitcoin's gonna get killed. Uh, because they're going to put their own currency. So again, this distinction between the technology platform on the one hand and the cryptocurrency on the other is critical. The technology platform will be around. The IMF has put out a working paper talking about the IMF using blockchain. Uh, the Federal Reserve is looking at it. Uh, other central banks are looking at it. The idea that blockchain distributed ledger technology might be used by central banks uh, as a way of keeping track or transacting in currencies, that's completely plausible. I think that is going to happen. Uh, but but to suggest that that's somehow bullish for Bitcoin is nonsense. In fact, it's the opposite. Uh, as soon as they're ready with their new uh, digital currency, they're going to kill Bitcoin because they don't want the competition, and they've got the ability to kill Bitcoin. So um, Bitcoin's a dead end. It's a roach motel. You can get in. I'm not so sure you can get out. Um, you know, look, some people have made some money on it. Some people have made a lot of money on it. There are some real Bitcoin millionaires out there. I don't dispute that. But that's, you know, that's like if I go into a casino with all your money, Alex, and I bet on red and it comes up red and I go back and say, hey, Alex, I doubled your money. You know, give me a nice fee. I'm a genius. Um, you might think I'm a genius unless you knew what I did. I basically could have lost all your money just as easily. So getting big paper gains doesn't make you smart. It just Sometimes you're just lucky. Sometimes it just came up red, but uh, next time it could come up black. And that, that's that's really the way this is going to play out. Wow. I was I was kind of hoping that you were going to say that's an unplausible scenario. <laughs> but there it no. is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And one, by the way, one, one more reason to have physical mm -hmm. gold. Uh, you know, physical gold is not does not just not only insulate you from all the stuff we talked about at the beginning of the podcast, the, the legal risk, the credit risk, the settlement risk, yeah, all, all that risk. And there's just a lot of them. Uh, but it's also not digital. It can't be hacked, can't be erased, can't be tracked, you know, just sitting in one place. Uh, and uh, so it's it's got a lot of features, which is why it has always been money. These are not 21st century inventions. Uh, it's true today, but it's been true for a long time. Very true. And I, I just heard that it's likely that Bitcoin is going to fork again, in other words, split. So this idea that it cannot go above a certain number is really not true. So it's not, it's not true at all. I mean, they can do whatever they want. They have this what they call community consensus. They make it sound all warm and fuzzy, like a New England town meeting. But it's actually based. The, the, the votes are from the miners, who are just a really small number. 51 51 percent of the mining's in China, and they just shut down the exchanges. You don't right. think the miners are going to be next? This is a house of cards. All right, Jim, uh, I've enjoyed the conversation today. Very much appreciate it and look forward to it next month. Thanks, Alex. You have been listening to The Gold Chronicles with Jim Rickards and Alex Stanzik, presented by Physical Gold Fund. Recordings can be found at physicalgoldfund.com forward slash podcasts. You can register there for news of upcoming interviews with Jim Rickards and other world-class thinkers.